Hi all, and welcome to Conversations with myself, Nick Conn. I'm delighted to introduce a really, really special guest today called Dr. Robert Lefevre. Robert is an absolute idol of mine in the addiction sector. He's personally been in recovery from all substances since around, I think, the 12th of October, 1984. He created the first rehab in the UK to look at all addictions, and that was in 1986. He wrote with Professor Jeff Jeffrey Stevenson the master's degree course in addiction psychology at London South Bank University, which is the first of its kind and one of the most highly regarded courses that a therapist can do. Robert is a TED speaker, a composer, and he's still an addictions counsellor. So please join me in welcoming Robert, who will be delivering a workshop today on how to help to change the behaviour of someone I love. So thank you so much for joining me on the show, Robert. Really, really lovely to have you on. Um, You're welcome. I would just like to start with, you know, I hate people that take drugs, especially border control. They get worse. <laughs> Honestly, they get worse. And, I, and they will continue to get worse. Well, I've got one for you. Okay. This sounds going to be a bit risque, but it's not. This chap was just coming up to his 100th birthday and the family wondering, what on earth did you get him for a present? And still one youngster said, why don't we send him a hooker, a lady of the night? And so they did. And on the day in question, she came round and she knocked on the door and he said, yush. And she said, I'm here to give you super sex. And he said, oh, oh, um, I'll take the soup. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Um, thank you. Um, always, always welcome jokes on this show, for sure. Um, so today we're going to look at a workshop, in, to deliver a workshop in really how to help change the behaviour of someone that we love. Um, so kind of going straight into it, Robert, I really would like to ask, what what is tough love? Well, tough love is saying something that is demonstrably true, but difficult for the speaker to say. Uh, people often get this the wrong way round. They think it's difficult for the recipient to hear. Uh, that may or may not be true. Often the recipient doesn't care whatever is said, but a parent may find it very difficult to say, I love you, but I don't like what you're doing. And I'm telling you my concerns precisely because I love you. An employer or supervisor may find it very difficult to say, your bad days now outnumber your good days. So it's difficult for the speaker. It's tough on the speaker, but not necessarily on the recipient. Sure, sure, that, that makes sense. So for anyone watching, can you explain really what, what an intervention is and perhaps when it would be used? Well, an intervention um, is a structured process, uh, preferably rehearsed in advance, in which an addict is told by a succession of people, I love you, or I care for you, and uh, never say but, because that wipes out the love. Right. I'm concerned for you. I observe fact, fact, fact. Never give opinions, because they can be contradicted, but facts that are demonstrably true, cannot be contradicted. And I recommend one, two, three. And so again, they have to be quite specific what you're recommending. And if you don't agree, I shall, uh, don't make idle threats. There has to be no doubt about the, inter uh, the intervention. And that's why the rehearsal is, is recommended. Um, I remember I did a, a, an intervention rehearsal with a family of a chap who was an MP, a, a member of the House of Commons. And we rehearsed it all particularly. And it was very moving when the younger son said, Dad, 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 Dad I, I, I don't like it when you do that. And we got it absolutely perfect. And then we came to the day itself. And we did the intervention and the wife said, oh, I'm sure we can sort it out. And I, ironically, um, last week on episode two, we 
we discussed the drama triangle and with the persecutor, the rescuer and the victim. And, and that kind of brings back a little bit of that as well. Yeah. With that mum in that scenario, potentially being the rescuer um, yes. and, and keeping that addict in the victim. But I think um, from my experience, they, they never, you can plan and you can plan and you can plan. Um, but, and I suppose many parents probably would have made idle threats before um, in these, inter you know, not necessarily even during an intervention, but I'm sure they've made many threats. So I suppose what you were saying, it's, it's vitally important to see those threats through. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. It's very difficult for parents. Um, I've known parents be in absolute despair when I told them you really do need to confront rather than simply love. The three things that parents try, love, education, and punishment. Love is wonderful, but it doesn't work in an intervention. You've got to be, got to be quite firm. Education is great, I and mean, we're doing an educational program now, but it doesn't work in the way that families would like it to work by telling them about the drugs and so on. They don't learn from that. I remember a lady, um, demonstrating that she had little boxes with samples of drugs in all of them so that families could learn what to look for. I said, that's the last thing they want to do. They need to go out to the cinema if they can in lockdown mm. or after lockdown. They need to do you know, something just for themselves. But looking at all these drug samples is not going to help the addict. They know all about them already. I mean, Plod goes into the schools and says, no, this is Moroccan black. You think the pupils don't know that? They've been using it. They've been selling it. You know, they know all that. Yeah. When I go to a school, I say, other people will tell you about addiction. I'm going to tell you about recovery. I'm going to tell you how to get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And so I got them. I've got their interest. Whereas if we just tell them about the drugs, they know that. And you're right, so, because I've done many talks at schools, many talks, and I, I don't tell them how bad drugs are because, you know, they, they've had their experiences, they love their experiences, and they've heard, or yeah. they've heard it from their friends and they've heard how great the experiences are. So I don't go in telling them how bad drugs are. I tell them how good they were and how much I loved them and the consequences, that, right. uh, the consequences that followed from that. Um, well, this is what Richard Bandler says about... Uh, Richard Bandler was the chap who created NLP with, with a friend of his. And he said, you've got to run the movie. You know, <laughs> we run the movie from there, all the bad stuff, or all the good stuff and, and that we're saying about what, what the drugs were like and how fantastic it was. And we get to here to the midpoint. And then we stop. And he says, run the movie. Take it on from there. Yeah. Show all the bad things that happened then. Yeah. So it's one of the ways we can diagnose addiction is by showing consequences. Absolutely. You know, we can diagnose if somebody's lost his job, uh, lost his driving license, lost his wife. Uh, you don't need to ask him about his alcohol consumption. There's nowhere else you can get those consequences other than through alcoholism. You can't get it through cancer or diabetes or heart attacks. It can only come as a result of drinking too much. And so running the movie the full way through is actually very helpful because it shows exactly where this is going. And of course, addicts will say, nah, it's not going to happen to me. I'm immortal. Well, I yeah. feel not. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in, um, in the scenario that, that you were giving about the, the rehearse, the, the intervention that you were doing and, and the mum said, it's okay, you know, we, we sort this and, and that kind of compulsive helping. What, what, what is a compulsive helper? Well, compulsive helping is a, pre a pre repetitive process in which kind helping goes too far. Okay. Its characteristics are caretaking, not caring, caretaking, becoming somebody's caretaker. Yeah. You belittle them, you patronize them. You assume that they've got to learn what you've got to tell them. And the other characteristic is self-denial. Oh, you don't need to worry about me. I, I don't count. I, I don't mind what it costs me. If it costs me an arm and a leg, I've got another one on the other side. Yeah. So caretaking and self-denial are the characteristics of compulsive helpers. 
And as you can see, they exactly match the characteristics of an addict, which is blame and self-pity. So yeah. when caretaking and self-denial meets blame and self-pity, look at that. It's a perfect fit. Yeah. And so they go looking for each other. Um, I believe that addicts and compulsive helpers are born, not made. I think this is a genetically inherited defect in the mood centers of the brain. There's not necessarily anything wrong in the thinking side of our brain. We can think perfectly well. You know, I worked all my professional life as a doctor, and, and my thinking brain worked well enough in that way. In, in my addictive way, I developed stinking thinking, which is a term that Alcoholics Anonymous uses. You know, my thinking, I, I could change sides in the middle of an argument and my wife wouldn't even notice. Yeah. I would try to prove black was white. You know, that's stinking thinking. Um, but addicts uh, comprise about one in six of the total population. That is a huge number. I've treated members of both houses of parliament. I've treated members of the House of Commons, members of the House of Lords. I've treated lawyers, doctors, um, architects, accountants, housewives, students, you know, people who are unemployed, right across the board, one in six of the total population. And these are the people who fill up the accident and emergency departments. If you go to an A&E department in an evening or at the weekends, you'll find it storming with people with addiction problems. Yeah. Now, and it doesn't discriminate, we, does it? Why don't we have a rehab of some kind attached to every NE department? They already have HIV departments attached to NE, yeah. so it's easy to walk from one place to another. Yeah. If we had an, an, a, an addiction rehab run voluntarily by members of AA or NA or OA or GA or whatever, people from the anonymous fellowships, if we had them, they'd be delighted to do that voluntarily. If we had that attached to A&E, it would clean it out because the people who really needed the help would get it. Yeah. And the people who didn't, who, who were just there because of genuine accidents and emergencies. I'm not saying that addicts don't have genuine addic addiction, but they have they had the lion's share of them all. But the other people will get the treatment that they need and deserve while the addicts are being treated appropriately primarily for their addiction and then for the accident, whatever it was at the same time. If we go to the morgues, we'll see that the majority of people in the morgues are there as a result of addictive use. It has a very high mortality rate with alcohol, drugs, food, you know, nicotine. Let's look at it. Nicotine kills 300 people a day in the UK, a it's a jumbo jet full every single day of nicotine addicts. Alcohol, it's got liver disease, um, heart disease, uh, um, um, brain disease, are all sorts of things that come disguised as physical illness, but really what they're caused by is the alcohol behind it. Yeah. Um, eating disorders, heart attacks, um, obesity, which is a major killer, these are the things we ought to be looking at, and the government does, but they don't see what's behind it, which is the addiction, yeah. and they don't treat that. And the reason for that is that governments would find it too expensive. If we say that alcoholism is a disease, that all addictions are a disease, then they'll have to pay they for have it. to pay for it, absolutely. One in six of the population, they'll say, no, 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 we can't do that. And so the Department of Health is very unlikely to adopt the belief that alcoholism, drug addiction, eating disorders is a disease. I believe it's a disease of neurotransmission. It's in the mood centers of the brain. It's when one nerve cell is trying to talk to another cell. It has a little connection mechanism in the middle. And that connection is chemical. So these are called, these chemicals are called neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. And people know about them. They know about dopamine. They, yay let's get blasted neurotransmitter they know about the serotonin the nurturant um, transmitter they know about dopa and gadamine and, and, and so on they know about these things the department of health certainly knows about them 
but they don't consider they could ever go wrong, which is barking mad. Every part of the body has something that goes wrong. My gran granddaughter, Ali, God bless her, has a thing called Kabuki syndrome, in which all sorts of things have gone wrong. She's a dwarf. She's got cataracts in both eyes. She's deaf. She's got only one kidney. Her heart um, uh, keeps stopping and has to be restarted. She's got nastidioblastosis, which is the opposite of diabetes. She's got lots of things. There are many children um, who have uh, lots of genetically inherited defects. And to imagine, as the Department of Health does, that the mood centers of the brain don't have genetic defects is not. They know that there are many things on the thinking side of the brain and they will treat them, but they don't treat the mood disorders. They say, not, that's not a real illness. Oh, really? Well, tell that to the addicts I've looked after. Absolutely. I've looked Absolutely. after over 5,000 inpatients with addiction problems. And once that illness is treated, 70% of them got well. I was in, in touch with two of them yesterday. There's a lovely story there. Uh, you don't um, pick up the drugs or the drink to become an addict or an alcoholic. That's right. And that's not someone's uh, goal when you do it. You know, yep. and um, so I think absolute ignorance from from their side, for sure, in terms of public health, you know, to, to think that this isn't a disease. Um, but it makes sense as to why why you say, you know, because then they would have to treat it. Um, well, that's the way it is. And I think that um, what happens is that addicts and compulsive helpers often form relationships with each other. Uh, incidentally, that's the only time I would ever use the word codependency, which is a, a multiple word, which means anything to anybody. It can mean, you know, you were born into an addictive family. It means you married an addict. It means you have both problems with alcohol and drugs and food. It means so many things. It means nothing. But codependency, as I use it, means the relationship between an addict and a compulsive helper. The perfect fit that I was mentioning earlier is that compulsive helpers maintain the behavior of the addicts, they keep it ticking over. So the first thing we have to do in an intervention is to peel off the compulsive helpers, to say, thank you very much. I don't need your help. You're actually getting in the way. Oh, but but I can, I, I know, so yes, I know. But please don't do it just at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And would you say that all professionals, Robert, you know, are compulsive helpers like doctors or well no it's certainly not true that all helpers in the profession helping professions are compulsive helpers that's not true but some of them are and in fact it is true that people who have a compulsive helping tendency will tend to go towards a helping profession but there are many people in helping professions who are not um you know uh, compulsive helpers at all They've just got the kindness of, of their, their hearts. So which compulsive helpers would you say would cause the most damage? Which compulsive helpers cause the most damage? Without any doubt, whatever, politicians. Interesting. They have a moral compass. They know what is good for the whole population. And... They have the power and they have other people's money. And so in they come. Oh, gosh. They cause immense damage. I sent my little book on compulsive helping to the 630 members of the House of Commons. Right. I sent every single one of them a copy <laughs> of the book. One of them wrote back to me to say thank you. Right. Would you, would you believe Tony Blair? Interesting. Uh, so Tony he, Blair responded. Uh, he, he took the trouble to come back to me. Um, interesting. I found on eBay a number of my books have turned up, obviously unread. So they, they just passed it off. So um, politicians really don't want to hear about compulsive helping. 
Um, they don't want to look at it in themselves and they don't want to look at it in anybody else. And they will reward compulsive helpers. There's somebody I know who got an honour for doing such wonderful work, helping the addicts by telling them what the drugs were made of and how to identify them. And that person got an honour for that. So compulsive helping is actually rewarded. And it's in our society, it's seeked in. Helping is a virtue. Well, indeed it is. But compulsive helping is a vice. It goes too far and it causes damage. So, and the, the politicians don't want to see that. I suppose it also could cause damage to the compulsive helper themselves. Yes, um, the compulsive helping does cause a great, a great deal of damage because of the self-denial. As I mentioned earlier, mm. you know, I've caused myself more damage through my compulsive helping than I did through my primary addiction. Right. And on my website, they've got all the questionnaires to identify addictive behavior. And I, I come out way out on top on that. I, I've got a whole string of addictions, but it was my compulsive helping that caused me the most damage. And I didn't realize that because my wife was the identified compulsive helper. She had no other addiction. She was just a compulsive helper, pure and simple. And she married me in order to get away from her abusive father. Well, that was a mistake. She went out of the frying pan into the fire. Yeah. She changed one addict for another. But after my wife died as a result of a, a stroke, then I had to look at my own compulsive helping. And I, you know, I was made bankrupt as a result of, you know, not monitoring my accountant. The frauds committed by my accountant caused me to go bankrupt. Also, my inadequacy in running a business. I'm not a good businessman. I didn't look after my business. And therefore, 120 people lost their jobs. They lost their jobs because of my compulsive helping. Well, nowadays, I'm very careful to look at my compulsive helping and to treat it through Helpers Anonymous. Or you can go to Al-Anon or Families Anonymous mm -hmm. or O-Anon. Or the, or, there's always a family um, fellowship to match the primary fellowship, Alcoholics Anonymous, Scamblers Anonymous, mm -hmm. Narcotics Anonymous. There's always a family equivalent. And those are the ones where people like me need to go for that part of me. I don't need to go to, you know, four or five different um, outlets for, for my addiction. I just go to two. I go to Alcoholics Anonymous uh, or Eating or, or, or Reefs Anonymous and Helpers Anonymous because they're not the same. They're the mirror image of each other. Mm -hmm. The fellowships match the addiction and the compulsive helping. So I need to go to one and the other. Yeah. And yeah. that's enough. I don't need to go to hundreds of other things. Just the two is fine. There are many other professions which actually attract compulsive helpers, social workers, probation officers, lawyers, teachers, doctors, and other healthcare professionals. They follow the lead of, of the compulsive helpers and they want the money. They, they follow the lead of the politicians and they want the money from them in order to support their good causes. So all these people may also be compulsive helpers and they apply, they apply to the politicians who in their compulsive helping give out the money and, and all the rest. The end result is that the addicts get away with blue murder because they're not being confronted. So how would you say to confront them then? I know we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. What's the best way to confront well, them? You've got to say, have a look at the consequences of your interventions. Did they work? When you tried love, did it work? Love is wonderful. Did it work? When you tried education, did it work? When you tried punishment, did it work? They're lovely things, but if they didn't work, they're no good. Mm -hmm. You've got to try something that does work. And that's what I can show people through the 12 step program. My last use of any addictive substance, you know, my gambling, I lost three months income on the turn of one card. Uh, my wife wasn't very happy about that, as I'm you might sure. imagine. I used to drink Colombian black coffee till my hands shook. 
I've been drunk conducting an orchestra. I, you know, I've, I've got all these, my weight used to vary by 50 pounds. Wow. Up and down and up and down. I took on work I didn't even want to do. All these things are part of my addiction. And I got the consequences of them. But my wife got most of the consequences. Yeah. But from my compulsive helping, I got the consequences. I was made bankrupt as a result of not monitoring the work of my fraudulent accountant. I got the consequence and we lost everything. We lost our home, our office, our rehab, and we finished up living in the homes of other people. People were very kind to us and they lent us their homes. And eventually I was visiting Canterbury where my father had been a priest. And I went to the church where he'd been on and I spoke to the vicar. And I thought she might say a prayer. And she said, well, we've got some almshouses. Would you like one? I said, wow, a home of our own? And she said, yes, well, there's a waiting list of, of two years. I said, well, that'd be fantastic. Two years in nothing. We were in within three weeks. Oh, wow. And she said, well, we know what you do. And there are many ways of entering the kingdom of heaven. Well, I'm not... <laughs> I'd never thought of that, but I've been extremely grateful to the Church of England ever since. We had a home given to us by the C of E, and we lived there for a year. Uh, living in an old people's home where the average age was 75, um, I, I'm sorry, the average age was 85. I was 73, so I was a youngster, but living in that, I, it's odd because you don't knock on people's doors. They don't want to be disturbed. If you want to talk to someone, you go and sit in the courtyard and they'll see you and they'll come and sit with you if they want to. But, you know, they were so kind to us. And eventually I was asked by the Bursa if I would give a talk to his Rotary Club. And I said, yes, I'd be delighted. And I did. And afterwards he said, you don't belong here. I wonder what on earth I had said. It was rather like the nurse when we first went there. She said, you can die here. And I thought, well, yes, I can. What she actually meant was you can stay here till you die. Nobody's going to throw you out. Mm -hmm. And the, I had a corridor, a, a certificate from the Archbishop of Canterbury, which said I could stay there forever. And if I couldn't pay the rent, the church would pay it. They were wonderful. But when the bursar said, you don't belong here, I said, oh, he said, no, you belong in London. You've got to get back to London. You need the wider audience. And so I gave back my corridor. And I had nothing. I had no security, whatever. I had to give it up before I could find my next step. And a friend of mine, whose daughter I'd helped, lent me a room from which I could do my consulting. And another friend of mine, whose son I'd helped, and gave me a place where I could live in a room in the basement of her home. And so I started again. And here I am now. And then nine years ago, a former patient from my medical practice said, would you like a cup of coffee? And I said, well, I, I don't drink coffee, but I'll have a, a glass of milk. And so we met in Carduccio's in South Kensington. And then she asked me for supper. And then she asked me for the weekend. And then we got married. It was, where did that come from? Who would want a bankrupt widower? But Pat said, well, you're fun. And so if you forgive the joke I told at the beginning, <laughs> that's how I get married. And so Pat and I have now been married for nine years. It's our wedding anniversary last week. Congratulations. I just had my 84th birthday. So I'm now 84, and I don't believe a word of that. I'm having a wonderful life. I haven't been out of this flat since 15th of March last year, because I have a high risk medical condition. So if I go out and catch COVID, I die. But I've also got acute allergies. I've, I've twice been unconscious as a result of, of bee stings. Wow. So I'm not allowed to have the vaccine. So if I catch COVID, I die. If I have the vaccine, I die. So it's death or death, I understand. So that's why I stay at home. 
and I'm having a wonderful life. I'm composing so pleased. music, writing. You know, I'm really having a gorgeous time. I'm so pleased. And talking about COVID, um, which is one of the questions I was going into. So, what what has been? What do you feel the the effects of COVID shutdown on addicts and compulsive helpers has been? Well, the addicts will rebel. And you see that in the news every day. It's rebelling against lockdown, against any form of restriction, against being told not to do things by the police. So, you know, the addicts are behind all of that. And when it's one in six of the population, that is a lot of people, a lot of addicts are disobeying all the rules. And they think it's clever. They think it's necessary. They think it's a libertarian. They think all sorts of things. Addicts have stinking thinking, same as I did. And so that's what happens to addicts in lockdown. And the compulsive helpers, and they look out for worthy causes. So they look for the people they can help, the things that they can do, going the extra mile, it's institutionalized in our culture. Mm -hmm. Compulsive helping is rewarded. And so these people, in, um, in, when they come up against the consequences of COVID, they want to say, oh, what can I do? What can I do? Where can I go? What can I do? Who can I help? And they get in the way of people who are doing sensible things. Now, the other tragedy is, of course, in lockdown, sometimes an abusive addict will get locked in with a family member who they're abusing. And the results there can be utterly tragic. Mm. You get murder and suicide and all sorts of things. It's absolutely tragic. So again, if only we could get the politician to understand what compulsive helping really is and peel them off and understand what addiction really is and give it the appropriate funding and the appropriate treatment with the 12-step program. If only, if only, if only. Well, why not? I live in hope. Absolutely. And just, just to sum up to people that have maybe skimmed parts of this or whatever the case may be, somebody that is living with an addict or an alcoholic or is associated with one um, and they are in denial and not or not willing to get help what what tips would you give them for them for, for what they could do to try and get that addict to become willing so just 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 just, just to jump in very quickly um what's your thoughts on booking an addict into a rehab and saying this is where you're going and when and should they not be willing explaining the consequences that could follow from that? Rehabs cost money. I've never been to a rehab other than to visit them and create one. All my um, recovery, such as it is, you'll have to judge that, is based on working the 12-step program. I don't believe in any religious God. My God is the 12-step program. It's worked for me since 12th of October, 1984. I've used no addictive substance in over 36 years. Um, but, you know, my behavior is still potentially that of an addict because I am an addict, it's genetic. And therefore I need to work the 12-step program each day. So the first advice I would give to anybody who's concerned for somebody else is find out who your friends are. You may find them in Al-Anon, Al-Anon family groups, you may find them in Alcoholics Anonymous. You may find them in a medical practice. Uh, you'll find that they've got notices about cross-step programs in most medical practices. Um, you may find it through a social worker. Find out who your real friends are, the people who know how you can get well long-term, and then do what they suggest. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much robert for coming on on the show today it is really been an honor as i've told you on numerous occasions you're my idol in the addiction industry um and i'm, I'm so delighted to have you and and i wish you well um and i wish you safe and uh, we will see you soon and 
thank you everyone for tuning in and stay tuned you can follow me on instagram at dad and recovery or you can subscribe to the youtube channel robert just to quickly say should anyone wish to look at these compulsive helping tools on your website would you mind just telling us what the website is my website uh, you can just get them through dr robert lefever is, um, is that dot com um, dot com dot com yeah great that, that's where i am uh, if you just google um dr robert lefever you, you'll find me it will come up and i will answer fantastic which is which is lovely to see and so thank by anyone, you for anyone that would like to continue any conversations with robert please feel free to reach out to him directly um and once again thank you stay tuned and see you soon